Hello, and welcome to the New Mexico Bureau of Geology informal lecture series. I am your host, Phil Miller, and today's topic is going to be on the modify features tools uh, in an editing session. Uh, so there's a few things that we need to talk about in conjunction with that. And one of the key things that I should remind everyone is that currently everyone should be on 3.2.2. Two, and that means that you're probably seeing this notification. Uh, at some point here in the near future, we will go ahead and update everyone to 3.2.2, and I'm um, not entirely sure when that rollout will happen, but it is in the works, and we are thinking about this, as I think there are going to be some updates that probably don't affect us too much, but we might as well go ahead and get up to the latest uh, software version. Uh, the other comment on that as well is we have wonderful news. Uh, all of the process for renewing our licenses through Esri has happened. We will have ARC map for another year. Everything went through. I just haven't verified that they have received our PO yet, uh, but I submitted it to them this morning. So we have great news on that front. Uh, we will have one more year of ARC map. So now's the time to abandon ARC map. Uh, let's, let's not use it like, uh, as a crutch. Crutch, let's go ahead and work on transitioning off of Arc Map and into Arc Pro. Okay, so uh, one of the other comments I'm going to make is uh, you will see that my settings are varied from everyone else's. As we use this software, all of our settings will drift apart from one another because of the functionality of what we do in our GIS environments. So from the get go, I'm gonna go ahead and open up my editing tab and you can see that I don't have the start and editing session on my functionality. And that's because my settings allow me to directly start editing in the data set. And because Dan asked this question, I decided I was gonna open up the Socorro map and destroy all of his data today. Okay, Dan, don't worry. This is a copy of it on my D drive. I won't ruin your data. Um, but with that, uh, one of the things that I also wanted to comment on is that uh, we don't, you, I don't have the modify pane open over here because I wanted to refresh everyone, much like Luke did, of how to add uh, tabs to our add tab pane tabs add tabs to our pane. That's an interesting uh, discussion that I haven't had to explain yet. So uh, what we want to do is on that editing tab, we have the create features. Mine is down here, so I automatically have that already. But we also have the modify features. And I removed mine specifically so I can demonstrate the click on modify so that I have my modify features open. The comment I'm going to make to that is, remember, we also have them here, and there's a subset of them, and the first ones that we see in mine are my favorites, and then we see the repeat of the tools that we see over here. If I click the drop down, you'll see a more graphic representation of what that looks like, so we can see that there are my favorites here. And I also wanted to demonstrate, much like Luke did, that uh, ability to add your favorite tools. So the one that I want to add is the Continue Features tool. I use this very frequently. So as you can see, uh, I hover over the tool. It pulls up the description of the information of what the tool does. So Continue Feature, Continue Sketching the Selected Features. You will notice that there isn't like the Query button that will help you pull up the help files, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But to add a favorite, we would right click on the tool we want to add and we would add it to favorites. And when I click that, we can now see that that secondary move tool is now replaced with my create uh, continue features tool. So I'm going to hover over here just so that we can go ahead and talk about the hover again. Hover will help describe to you what the tools do. And one of the other comments that we should make in conjunction with that is you'll notice that there is no help query button here to click to then pull up the web browser for the GIS help files. So I wanted to remind everyone that that button is the F1 key on your uh, uh, GIS. If you hit F1, it will pull up the, mo the tools. And because I was in the modify features tools, sorry, I got it two of them now, because I was in those when I hit F1, content aware. It is uh, uh, It knew where I was when I hit the F1 key, so it knew what I wanted to look at. 
I'm actually going to, oops, shift tab. I'm going to go back to the one that is the master list reference of the modify feature tool reference of the GIS help files. So in here, I strongly recommend that when you're trying to work with tools and you're not sure what they do, or you think there's something you want to do, you can always in your browser search specifically for uh, the functionality you want. Ask it like a question. My recommendation is, this is personal uh, discussion here, I would rather give credit where credit is due. So most of the browsers now, when you type in your question, you're going to get the AI reference at the first one. I recommend skipping that and going to the source. Go to Esri, get the information you want when you type in that question. Um, that will then allow you to possibly find the resource or find the person who has discussed or solved the solution for someone else. So as you can see, there is tons of information here. Each one of them probably has their own. Uh, um, uh, I think each of these ends up with their own tool discussion somewhere else, but I haven't messed with that too much. So I wanted to discuss that. So we've covered the mod adding the modify pane. We've covered adding a favorite, we've covered the hover, we've covered the help. Now it's time to cover the tools themselves. So I am not going to go over every single one of these tools in the modifies tools list because there's a bunch of them. And I'll also comment that at some point we'll get to the validate tools when we talk about uh, modifying and editing our geologic our topology. And the other comment I'm going to make is I'm mostly focusing on the editing tools that we use in creating our geologic maps, whether we're digitizing or directly inputting from our field maps. So those are the tools I'm kind of focusing on, again, because that's kind of the preference of this group uh, is to be talking about the geologic map uh, functions as well, uh, primarily. So we, if we start off, I wanted to talk about the move tool first because it is one of the more obvious ones. So I'm going to go ahead and select a feature. When I select a feature, by default, typically the tool, oops, when I select a feature, typically the move tool would be the tool that it automatically goes to. So if I just select the feature, click and drag, oh, I select, oh, right, it's on. There is, I, right, 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 sorry, uh, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. There are times when you finish sketches, there's settings in here that will automatically default you back to the move tool. That's the way I should have said that. Um, and I can't remember exact functions and the exact direct settings without going in and looking at it, but I think we've covered that in other, uh, in the settings video, uh, how some of those occur. I don't know that we went over it explicitly, but I know it was one of the options that I uh, kind of skimmed over quickly. So there are functions that will automatically default back to this move tool after you do a step. So I'm gonna go ahead and select the move tool. We can now see that I can click and drag and move that line. So that's the move tool. There are ways to modify how that functions directly, and I'm not going to get into that too much, uh, but if we had a single line, and I click move, it's somehow remembering, and I don't remember it doing this before, so in my testing this didn't happen, uh, it's, it's somehow remembering topology and it's retaining the rules of topology in that move. So there's a setting that I have somewhere that's modifying that. Normally, it would just move this line separate from the feature. If I were to uh, find an orientation point, let's turn one of those on and show that instead. So if I select an orientation point and I'm on the move tool and I go ahead and move, it would just move that feature I hit F2 and it moves that feature itself. That is the more uh, common way that we see that move tool function. So again, you would select the feature, let the move tool take over, move the tool, hit F2 to finish that function of moving. Um, I am almost certain that if I select this tool, I move this feature, and if I go to another orientation point, let's see if I can find one in the vicinity of this one. This may have been a mistake. So we can see where it was 
and where I moved it to, if I come and select another tool, in previous versions of Arc Pro, the move wouldn't stay in place unless I hit F2. So in order to complete this move, you would have to hit F2. When I deselected this one, we saw that it stayed up here. So they have fixed that bug. So does everyone see if we look right here, if I redo and undo how it retained the move? Fair warning, if you're using previous versions of Arc Pro, that move did not operate that way. If I were to move a feature, and then click on another function, this would jump back to here. So there was a step to click the F2 key to finish that sketch to actually make that move a permanent uh, 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 move in the data. Um, so I'm mostly covering that. That shouldn't be a case anymore because Esri has fixed that for us. So we can also see that when I click on a tool and I start doing things, it pulls up in some circumstances that modify uh, features, move tool functionality that we can see. The other common tool that we get to working in is the edit vertices tool. So I'm going to come in here and zoom in. I'm going to click my favorite version of it, the edit vertices. And now we can see that it pulls up the functionality to edit vertices. Uh, one of the discussion points of this is <clears throat> when we're modifying vertices, we typically want to be able to select a vertice. So if I hover over, we can see the icon change to that uh, upright diamond instead of a square. That lets me know that I'm about to modify that vertice. And if I click on that vertice, we can now see that there's a different symbol than all the rest of them. So it looks like it pulls that vertice above the line. That's how we can tell that that is the selected vertice. And then I can again, click and drag and move that vertice where I need to. One of the other functions that's kind of nice is if I click, you can also right click and click edit vertices as well to get there as to get to the edit vertices as well. So if we're directly on a select, if we right click on the line, I can click edit vertices to get there as well. Another function that we should talk about is if I'm on the line and you can see the line segment icon to the lower right of my arrow, if I click on that, that will select the two vertices on either end. So we can see that when I clicked, I selected that, uh, those two vertices in between uh, the two vertices of the line segment. That's a better way of saying it. If I want to uh, go ahead and select the next segment, I can hover over it. If I press the shift key and click, I will select those two vertices as well. And now I can move those vertices where I need them to. Okay, so that covers the uh, edit vertices tools. I would like to go ahead, get out of that function, and now talk about the next tool. Oops, let's do a select. And I want to talk about the reshape tool. So if I click reshape, one of the things that we need to be careful about with reshape is how we use the tool. So I'm going to talk about that in a little specifics in a second, but I want to show what the reshape does. So what I can do here is reshape this to whatever I need the line work to be. And what this does is it takes the segment between the start click location and the end click location. And if I double click, it reshapes that to the new segment I've drawn. Now I understand that that was a little absurd, but let me show you the simplification. If I do, if I've got a mess and I made a mess by accident, I can click on the line. You have to start on the line and finish on the line when you use the reshape tool. So I'm going to go ahead and with my reshape tool active, I'm going to go ahead and click on the line. Click on the line in the segment that I want to reshape. And if I hit, if I double click here or hit F2, we can see we have reshaped that feature. And in this case, we simplified it. In the previous case, we added more detail. The reshape tool, I cannot express how useful it is. It is, as you can see, 
There's move, edit vertices, and reshape. For me, reshape is one of the tools that I use on a regular basis. It is extremely functional and handy for a lot of the stuff we do here. Um, there are times when you're streaming that you make mistakes and you don't want to finish the sketch for a single vertice that's off. You may want to go ahead and say, I'll come back to that. And that's where the reshape tool can come in handy. Or you realize that your line work may not be rep best represented of what's going on. Oops, I made a mistake here. Let's go ahead and um, modify the features to do what I want to do. And I meant it to be more like this. And because we need to start and stop, Notice that I moved the two vertices where I want them to be. I can now select this tool, select my reshape, and reshape that like that. So again, you saw me move the two vertices that needed to move because we have to start on the line we're reshaping and we have to end on the line we're reshaping. Um, so you can see, I, I'm gonna skip these two uh, um, well, I'm going to skip this one for the time being. I use this one a lot. Uh, we may talk about it later on. We'll come back to the split. There's times where that's really handy. And I want to go ahead and talk about the continue features tool. So I'm going to start off by drawing a line. Luke covered this last, last week. So I don't want to dis, uh, uh, take away from what he covered, but I do think it's important. Again, I went to finish that sketch and we remember that our exclamation mark is warning us that the value doesn't fall within a domain type. We are trying to fix this, but one of the other comments that I will make with this is when you see these exclamation marks, it's a reminder that there might be user required input. So if I right click and come to properties, come to my attributes, like we know it will do, it will highlight the field. Thank you, Luke, for pointing that out. If we go to type and I am in fact drawing a contact, I can correct that. It switches to green, letting us know red is bad, green is good to go. I click OK. I hit F2 now. I have finished my sketch. And it disappeared. Why did it disappear? Uh oh. I have something else occurring. I'm going to try a different example. Let's try a different example. So here is my sketch. I would like to continue this feature. And if we click on the edit vertices function, we start on green. Green is good to go. Red is stop. So if we stopped drawing this line on red and I want to continue the feature, when I click on continue feature, we continue from the point we stopped on. So we start on green, we stop on red, and I want to continue this feature. I can now click the next segment I want. We see that that next segment becomes the stopping point, and I can continue a feature. This is really handy if you've drawn something, you finish your sketch, you want to be done for the day because it's five o'clock, but you're not done with this line, you want to come back later in the day, or uh, the next day. You can go ahead and pick up where you left off by selecting the line. Click Continue Feature, and then you can continue working with the feature that you want to. Don't forget to save your edits or discard your edits or delete your features as Luke demonstrated in the last video. I'm going to go ahead and discard all of these edits so that we return back to original functionality and we can see that the map is back in the state that it was. Don't forget that if you've got save periodically through time, these will save for you. You can manually save them. Just remember, save, save, save. It is to your advantage to make sure that you are being proactive with preserving your data. Okay, so we covered the continue features. I'm gonna go ahead and go back to my modified features pane. And the next tool I wanna cover is the Let's go ahead and look at the split tool now. So I've selected the split tool. There are times where we want to break into the middle of a line. So let's go ahead and select a line. We can see that this is the continuing through flowing line. For one reason or another, I want to change this maybe from, I believe this is coded as an approximate. Yes, this is an approximate contact. What if I wanted this part to continue to be accurate and i did want this segment 
to be approximate. That is where the split function would come in handy. I don't want to reshape the line. I don't want to redraw the line. I want to split it right here. I want to cut it into a different segment. So I'm going to come here and I'm going to go ahead and split this line. And at that point, we see that the uh, left segment flashed really quick. If I clear the selection and reselect it, I have split it into this segment and I've split it into two segments. In this case, the left segment and the right segment or the west segment and the east segment, since we're talking spatially. With that now, I can then go ahead and go to my attributes. And in that attribute, go ahead and change this to be 010101, an accurate contact. If I hit enter, it goes ahead and does that. And I'm going to set my data source to one that's in the domain so it doesn't argue with me. And now if I clear my selection, we'll see that that line has changed to match the line symbology of the line above it, like we wanted to. So that's how the split function works. It works on uh, 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 polygons or lines. And unfortunately, I'm just working with the lines here, but I do want you to know that this function will work with um, lines or polygons. Reshape, if I'm not mistaken, works on lines and polygons as well. Edit vertices will work on lines and polygons too. Um, so there's that, we've covered split. One of the other things that uh, I, uh, we can talk about now is I now have a line segment that doesn't need to be broken into two sections. It isn't purposeful that it's broken into two sections. What if I wanted this segment now that I've split off to be joined to this segment as a continuous through flowing segment? I can go ahead, select, uh, use my select tool, press shift. Click the second line segment. Now I have two line segments selected as we can see over here in the attributes. I can then go ahead and click the merge. And as it says with the hover, merge two or more features into its existing feature or union two or more features into a new feature. When I click merge, we'll see in the pane on the right, my tool switches from attribute to the merge tool functionality. And in that, it is a, a resource to allow you to show you which segment you're going to preserve. Do we want to preserve this segment? And as you see, when I click on it, it goes ahead and highlights the line specifically. When I click on the second segment, it highlights the second segment. So this allows you to pick and choose which segment you would like to preserve. Very nice in functionality. If you've already got features populated in there and you'd like to retain those functionalities, because this line segment doesn't have a domain. It's warning me that this is out of the domain. I wouldn't worry about that too much, but if you do see these errors, let the GIS team know so that we can get your domain of your geodatabase corrected for you to prevent this warning from propagating. So it doesn't make sense to join to the warning. It probably makes sense to join to the one that has no warnings. And then we can go ahead and click the actual merge button to execute the merge. When I click merge now, we see that this these two segments merged into one segment, retaining the object ID of that merged feature. So if I clear my selection now and select my segment, we see that it's no longer two segments. It is only one segment. OK, so there's that. I'm going to click back on the modify features merge uh, content aware pane to get us back to our modify tools. So remember these panes do have nested views within them. If you get deep in a menu, look for that back arrow to get back to the master pane information. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about, and this is more specific to bad instructions that I had given early on in my tenure at the Bureau, and I'd like to correct, planarize. There are times where we use planarize for a functional purpose. Um, I have used it on corrupt data and planarizing lines can correct. Maybe that's a bad way of saying it, but I have used planarize to break lines into their individual segments to correct issues of geometry errors. And 
that is a way deeper description than most of you need to know. But I provided that instruction at one point and I think I gave the wrong messaging. It was to correct an error, not a default function that everyone should do. And what Planarize does is it breaks lines into their individual segments at any point of intersection. So this looks like a planarized line. It may be done with purpose. It may be done uh, for symbology purposes. And we can see that within the symbology, it's due to the fact that this is a continuous contact. This is a separate segment and this is a separate segment. So let's talk about what planarize does because there are times where this might be useful. If I select these two lines and I were to click planarize, it would split this line into a segment starting here and ending here. This would be a non-affected segment, but then this would become another split segment. So we would split this single line into two separate lines because of this intersection that happens at this line. So at this triple junction, that's where the planarized split will occur. There are times where you may actually want to planarize uh, a, a feature like that. But again, that's why we covered the split tool. Um, the other comment that I want to talk about with planarize and splitting and functionality like that I'm going to talk about geology for a second, so bear with me. And, and the reason why this is kind of important is um, it makes more sense to have a through going line segment for the faults instead of having individual segments for these. So through this circumstance, I'm going to open up the attributes and we can see that there is a field that has an error. But if we click through these, we can see that all of these say they are the Contreras Cemetery Fault, 020203, 020203, 020203, 020203. So we have three segments that are all symbolized the same. The data source is the same. The location accuracy is the same. There is no reason to have this broken into segments. So again, this would be a great functionality for using the merge. If I were to merge those together, I can go ahead and connect them into one segments. We see our symbology becomes much cleaner. And the reality of the nature is, is we shouldn't have broke the fault at this contact because faults split contacts. We should use our geologic knowledge to model the data to better reflect the geologic uh, occurrences that happen. Faults split contacts. So we should use that same logic. Faults should split contacts into their individual segments. Faults where the symbology is through going should match that through going symbology. And everyone's going to say, well, what about here, Phil? Why are you going to leave that alone? And that's because the symbology changes at this contact. It's because we're not totally certain of its locational accuracy here, but this segment we are. This is a fine time to have these two lines split. And it's because this unit is somehow obscuring this fault in one way or another, whereas this unit doesn't split the, uh, um, doesn't obscure the fault uh, offset the same way that this unit is. So this would be a fine thing. There's nothing wrong with this, but this segment right here split by the contact, it'd probably be better to split the contact at that segment. Again, reflecting the model of the geology that we're building. Okay, we jammed through those way quicker than I ever thought we would. So let's go through and go back and then look at some of the other lines that we have. Um, so merge, uh, we talked about that briefly. Uh, we can go into a little bit more detail about the merge function. There are times where we have, and I'm gonna use this as an example, where we should probably go through, and unless there's a reason that the attribute table data is different, we should probably go in and merge these lines. And I'm going to go ahead and give an example. I'm going to engineer an example. Let's go ahead and do that. So if I select that line, what if my location accuracy of this contact who is accurately located, 
what if this was five? Five meters of locational accuracy. We think it shifts, could be plus or minus five meters. And this one says 10. If we have mapped it that way and recognize that that offset is true between these two, if we merge this, we will lose that functionality. So now that I've merged it and I select this line and we look at the attributes, all of them now say the accuracy, the location confidence in meters accuracy of the feature that we merged it to. So I have actually obscured some of the information that I have coded, or Dan has coded into this data, right? We lost that this was accurate to 10 meters. I don't remember which segment now, but we've lost that locational accuracy. So we've somewhat degraded the data or we've overrepresented the accuracy of the data. Two ways to think about that. Um, so that is one way that the merge functionality can work to our advantage. I'm going to go ahead and go undo. Oops. Okay, good. Uh-oh. Uh, make visible. It didn't. Well, that's interesting. I didn't realize that merge was not um, uh, an undoable function. Oops, <laughs> uh, that would have been a bad mistake to have done. Uh, so w w collectively, we have learned something. Merge is not something that we can undo. That is a good thing to know. Wow, um, interesting, okay. Um, Let's go back to our modify features. Go back. Um, buffer. That's an interesting one to discuss. Um, hmm. I guess that's not a bad idea. Let's go ahead and cover that one. I don't use it very often except for one very specific purpose that we use it for. But let's say we needed to um, make a selection around this gradational contact. If I select the buffer, we can then go ahead and set a buffer distance. And I want to see, you know, let's do 10 meters around this feature. And there's functionalities that we could do. We could do both sides. We could do left side. We could do right side. We could do rounded or we can do squared. I'm going to leave it as the default here. Rounded, you can see, will build a buffer around in a rounded way. A square will square it off at the edge. If you want to see the preview, you can click the preview. I need to make it bigger, I'm guessing. Let's do... There we go. So that's what it's projecting that that would look like if I ran that buffer. If we actually execute running that buffer and deselect, we can now see that we have a feature. And unfortunately, my color is red and red, so it's hard to see that that deselect. But it has created a buffer around that feature. There are times where this is used. You wouldn't normally do this in contacts and faults. Again, I'm doing this for demonstration purposes, not that you would want to create a buffer in your contacts and faults. But if uh, like we use it to um, expand our map extent polygon. So in our geologic map, we have our map extent polygon. And there's times that we need the map extent poly buffer. So let's go through that process. And as another functionality, let's also talk about geoprocessing because some of these tools are in many locations. So let's do buffer. So I typed in buffer, it pulls up the buffer tool. I'm gonna go ahead and turn on my map extent poly layer. I'm gonna grab the polygon itself, oops. Drag it over. That is my input feature. I want to buffer it with some distance. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, save this in my Socorro Scratch geodatabase. And I'm going to go ahead and do 500. Now, you'll notice just to the right of that, it says unknown because I haven't committed it. 
once I commit this by clicking into the next field or hitting the tab button or clicking on unknown, by default, it recognizes the uh, units of the coordinate system and will use those by default. So if I hit tab, it defaults to meters because UTM, Universal Transverse Mercator, is captured in meters. That is the unit of measure in that coordinate system datum. So when I clicked over, it went ahead and defaulted to meters, but you do have the ability to change this to whatever unit you need to change it to. You can also modify a whole bunch of functionalities with that as well. I'm going to ignore those for the time being because they aren't required. We saw that distance was required. If I click run, we will then generate a buffer. And if we come and look, we will see that we have offset by 500 meters. And we notice that it's rounded. And there's a couple things we could do. We could do planar or geodesic. There's... Um, I'm going to skip that for the time being. There's other options, and remember, much like we talked about earlier on with our help files, now we have the query icon or the information icon. If we hover over it, it pulls up more information about that. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this query really quick, because if I'm not mistaken, this will pull up the tools specific help. I was certain that the, yeah. I was certain that the information icon would do that as well. Sure enough, it's the query. So let's show that again. So this button, I'll click it again, is what pulled up the specific help for the buffer tool. So they are content aware. They're not as content as aware as I was hoping, uh, unfortunately. Okay, so we've showed a couple of different tools. All of these, uh, 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 these are more for like modifying while you're working. This would be a functionality that you wanna do on a geoprocessing scope. Um, there have been times where we use things like, uh, where is it? Looking, 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 explode. Explode is another good tool. Um, it, it's not as, um, I'm going to say useful while you are directly inputting your data, but there are times where it can be useful. Um, there are data sets that exist, and um, I, I, I'm, there are data sets that exist where all of your specific line types are merged together but are not continuous. So I'm going to do an example of what this would look like. Currently, I'm selecting on an 010101, and we can prove that because over here it says 010101. If I come to my select by attributes, sorry, select by attributes, I'm going to select all of my contacts where symbol is equal to 010101. When I do that, we can see now that all of the feature classes, all the features that represent an accurately located contact are selected. Ignore me for a split second. I'm going to merge them. You will find in, uh, is, I, I've noticed this in particular with kind of older data sets, and I'm not sure exactly the purpose, but I'm certain that there was, this was done by a purpose. But I have seen data sets where when you want to select a specific line, you go to click on that line and you would see something like this, where I've tried to select a specific line segment and I select all of the specific segments that are of a specific type. Well, you can't really work with those then because there's no way to come in, select a specific line and work with it easily because now we have to deal with this. And this is just extra resources in the computer that are being used to modify vertices. In this case, this is where the explode features comes in handy. So I'm going to come back. I've got features selected. <laughs> when I explode them, it will break all of these merged segments back in the, the multi-part 
uh, feature into their individual components. So when I merged these, I created multi-part features. Sorry, I should have said that earlier. I have created multi-part features. If you see an error when you click on a feature and you're trying to do something and it says warning, multi-part feature, editing operation not allowed, that is warning you about this problem and the ability to uh, break those multi-part features into their individual segments, we have to use the explode. So separate, select multi-part features into individual features. These parts become independent features and are assigned identical attributes. I click explode. It pulls up the uh, uh, extra functionalities. We can keep originals. There's goods and bads to that. Know that that's an option. And notice that they all have one unique object ID. If I click explode, it'll take some time now, but it will break those segments into their individual features. When I clear the selection and select a specific segment, I can now only select that. I can now select just that specific segment. Um, Okay, those are the main tools. I didn't think I was going to have enough time to get into the explode and, or the merge, so I'm glad I was able to. You got a little bonus content with the buffer. Um, with that, I'd like to go ahead now and open it up to questions. Are there specific tools that anyone would like me to cover? Let's uh, keep the focus of this question uh, to anything I've covered so far, so specifically modify features, help files, or anything like that. So let's go ahead and open up the floor to questions. Does anyone have questions? No promises that I can answer them either. Bill, uh, go ahead, Andy. I was just going to have a comment, Phil. You might want to go over if you merge faults that are normal faults, how it may flip. Oh, that is a great. Uh, I don't have any in here. The problem. <laughs> I'm going to have to engineer some problems. So give me a second while I engineer a flaw. So if we've drawn this fault, ignore, to pay no attention to what is happening with the man behind the curtain. Okay, so I've got a fault uh, where the teeth is on the, I'm, I'm going to call this the, uh, the west side, and here the teeth are on the east side. So we've got a mismatch of orientation, and we know this is the problem. I'm going to go ahead and select, ooh. oh, that is, okay. I'm going to go ahead and select, oh, it's ICY. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and select. Oops. Well, oh well. Okay. Now I'm going to select the segments and now I'm going to merge them. To, oh, that would be more fun to do, but I'm not going to do it. Uh, so I've selected three segments now. If I do the merge and I'm picking a specific feature, what happens to the orientation and direction of that line? And did you see how it flipped the line? So, there are times where this can actually create a problem, especially with, and that's why I wanted to comment on that little segment in the middle. What if we've drawn a line, drawn a line, drawn a line, but there's one tiny segment that we, uh, Rick, can you mute yourself, please? Hang on, is it picking up something? Thank you. So if we have a little segment in there and accidentally have it selected, it can flip the entire orientation of a whole line together that we didn't intend to have flip, and you'll see the line flip. So merge can create problems if a line segment, and this is really true, when we're zoomed way out, we couldn't see that I had that segment selected at all. It was unnoticeable because of the nature of the way symbology draws at scale. And when I merge that, it may have flipped an entire line's orientation, flip a uh, reverse direction, right? Not flip. We're not saying flip anymore. Uh, flip is an arc map. Reverse direction is arc pro. Sorry, I old habits are going to die hard with me. Reverse direction. It can reverse direction on us unintentionally and also unperceptually. We may not be able to perceive that that has happened and that can create problems. So we need to be a little bit careful with regard to merging. 
what happens with orientations. The same would be true with a multi-part feature. If you merge multi-part features, dangerous things can happen. And we need to make sure that we're really paying attention to those. And there's some ways we can do that. Thank you, Andy, for that comment. Outstanding. I that that merge can be dangerous. Merge can be very functional. I only know this from experience. So <laughs> do you have, I. You have to watch really careful whenever you do that because if even if there's that a little tiny segment, like or you have multiple segments, it it can do all kinds of crazy things. So you, if you do it, merge is fabulous, but just be careful. Yep, absolutely. Um, uh, I can't remember who had the next question next. Rick, did you have a question? Yeah, I want to follow up on what what's being talked about right now. I haven't tried this in Pro yet, but in Ten, when you merged and your your two lines have different directionalities. And then you try to do the, the tool where you continue the feature. Oftentimes your endpoint is somewhere in the middle of the line. Yep. And uh, then you can't, you can't do that tool. I'm just wondering if that's been corrected here. No, it does the same thing, especially if it's preserved the multi-part. So that would be one of the circumstances where you would have to explode correct your line work for reverse direction and then go ahead and merge them back together and in that circumstance they merge permanently together they're not a multi-part feature and then you can continue that line if they are reversed and you merge them they are a multi-part feature okay i believe dan had a question next i had a question uh it's probably basic question but i never used the buffer command it creates a polygon or an area around a line or something it, it's not really it's not in, it's not like a map unit poly is it what do you do with them use do you use the buffers to like select things or attributes around it what's what's the purpose of a buffer Uh, and that was kind of why I commented that we don't use it in geologic mapping very much. We use it for very specific purposes. Uh, your comment of if you wanted to select a feature around a thing, if you did select by location, you can add a buffer to your location to select features around a feature. So that's the tool you're looking for with your example. Um, in a geologic map, I can't come up with a good rationale why you would specifically do that to create that. But no, it doesn't create a, a map unit poly. That is something completely different. Remember, that would be a completely separate feature class. It yeah. creates a buffer around an area. And when I used the buffer tool, we saw that I created a separate feature class. The buffer is just a buffer within the line feature itself um, and i don't know a better way of saying that i'd have to dig into it in more detail but you notice it did not create a new feature it created a buffer around that feature mm -hmm. we use it let's let's talk about why we use it if we're building your cross sections and we want to look at the elevation data around it if your cross section profile the the cross section line 3110 please correct me if i'm wrong 3110 if it touches the edge of your map and this raster comes right to the edge of the map you may have a vertice that doesn't have an elevation value at the end when we create your segmented profile that would be problematic because then it would drop down to zero and then it would spike back up to where it has elevation. So you'll notice that the raster I have for elevation has a thousand meter buffer around it. That's so when we create the segmented profile, we don't accidentally have a no value or a uh, pixel, uh, a, a lack of pixel on the edge so that it can actually obtain that elevation value when we're creating that segmented profile. Okay. So that's the reason why we use it. We use it for this raster right here. We use it when we're clipping your um, topology vector features so that they extend beyond the edge of the map. Because if they don't, and you've got a, a boundary that extends like this, and I then trim it without the buffer, you will see the line symbology inside your map giving the false impression that this is the edge of the area when actually this is the edge of the area, right? So with our buffer, it happens 1,000 meters away. So you see this 
not this. So we use the buffer for a couple very specific purposes because we have the topologic map data for the entire state of New Mexico. Drawing the entire state of New Mexico when we're working on a 24K slows the computer down horribly. So the buffer allows us to trim it to that extent, but then not have the artifacts of being trimmed. Okay. Uh, Mark Leo Russell, you got a question. Yeah, and I think I know the answer, but I just wanted to have you elaborate. Earlier, Phil, you were talking about if we had a a feature on a geo map, I think it was a contact, and we wanted to denote part of it as being a tentative contact, uh, a, a dash line as we used to put on geo maps. But you were talking about how you had to split that segment into two or more segments. Why? Why do you have to split it? The example I gave was for locational accuracy. Remember, our attribute tables have much more information in them than just the symbology. So if I select this line and we look at the attributes, this location confidence is 30 meters. What if only this segment is accurate to 30 meters? You used the symbology, which is this value right here. We're not changing symbology. We're changing a parameter of the flat table information of the fields that contain that information. So what if this segment was accurate to 10 meters and this segment was accurate to 30 meters? Well, currently as it's drawn, we can't separate them because the whole line says 30 meters. So if we split it at the junction of this contact, now I have split it. Now I can denote that segment as being 10 meters separate from this segment. Okay. In conjunction uh, uh, with uh, that, we also have, what if I mapped this line and you mapped this line? Then the data source needs to be two different people. So I would be the data source for one segment. You would be the data source for the other segment. Okay, D different example than you were showing earlier, but that's exactly what I was thinking about. So you could have finer granularity on attributes. It's the attribute functionality of why we split lines. Or now, it's a corrective measure because more we're talking about when you're editing a geologic map, because what if Dan drew a fault and he drew the thing all the way across and then realized, oh shoot, it's located, it says it's accurate across a QAL unit, but it's not a quaternary fault. If it shows as accurately located across that quaternary unit, that says that you can see offset in the quaternary, and that might not be true. Right. So we would split that segment in between so that we can code that as concealed because we don't see a surface expression of that quaternary offset because it hasn't been offset in the quaternary. Okay. And I guess that's a, follow a second follow-up question would be, do you guys consider it good practice if I had, let, let's say, again, to use this example, <clears throat> excuse me, two line segments, uh, and I realize they have identical attributes, should I merge them together? Yes, please. Okay. With Rick's warning, well in mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. If that ends up making it to where there's less attribute, th there's less um, records, uh, tuples, entries in the attribute table. There's less uh, features that you have to funnel through to find the feature you're looking for if you're looking at the attribute table specifically. And I'm using this as the attributes because this is how I function. Normally my attribute table is actually over here on a separate monitor and I usually have both open depending upon what I'm doing functionality. But yeah, that would allow you to have one record, one entry in that thing uh, where there isn't a need for two. This is where this kind of gets dangerous, though, because like you said, what if all the attributes for 010101 are the same? All of the uh, data sources are all the same, and we merge them all together? Well, now we've got a multi-part feature. Multi-part features, maybe this is personal preference. I hate working with them. 
I do not like selecting a line and selecting 5,000 disconnected segments. That drives me nuts. That's why I went into the explode. Mm, makes me absolutely bonkers. And I see old data sets where clearly a non geologic savvy person seemed to have done that because that's the only thing that I can think of. And they're just a data person. They're like, well, these are all the same. So let's merge them all together. Not recognizing that representatively in the model, remember, this is a model of geology. We've called them all the same things. No, this is a model and we want to model the geology for how the model actually functions in the real world. Building in those splits at the faults, splitting the contacts, models the geology better because the fault splits contacts. So modeling it the way it's actually represented is a much better way of doing it. Merging all of those together into being the multi-part feature just doesn't, those aren't connected. They aren't the same thing, mm. which is what that suggests and implies to a user. All of these are the same thing. They are, but they're not the same feature. Yeah, it, and it really comes down to how you properly abstract reality into GIS data. Right. Yeah. And that's okay, why we're. You. And that's why we're talking. That's why I talk about it about a geologic model. We're modeling the geology. It's like your car model. It looks very similar to the one that's in the parking lot, but it's not quite the same. Concessions were made for scale. Let's model it as best as we can to represent the scale while keeping the scale mentality of we have to make concessions but let's keep it consistent with what it's like out there in the real world mm. okay thank you thank you and you can avoid some of the merge issues if you just continue feature that's actually really helpful so if you're drawing something instead of having five billion lines through there or whatever um, it's really nice if it if you just continue the line that you extend to extend that that's just my comment Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. One more question. It actually yeah, fills something it. that uh, Dan asked earlier that uh, I, I have an example that might not be strictly a geo mapping uh, application, but Dan, one place that we've done a little bit of work on doing buffering is when you're looking at mine waste piles and their proximity to drainage is oh, cool. either put a buffer around the drainage and see if it overlaps the mine waste or vice versa. And yeah, of course, okay. then we're looking at what the contaminants are and other things. But I know that's not directly mapping, but an application that we've used some buffering. Thanks, yeah. Mark. That's a great example. I couldn't think of one off the top of my head. Thank you. Perfect. Well, if we have time, I have one more question about a, a tool. Uh, what's Align features. I don't think I've used that. Align features. It's like it might be useful. Uh, if I accidentally shuffle a polygon in the map. Yeah, I am not prepared to present on that at all. Um, um, are those, those are early ones, right? Yeah, so. Um, Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, and forgive me, I don't use these tools because I am very anal retentive with how I build things. I'll be blunt about it. I am very specific with how I do things. If I bumped a polygon, yeah, things could function that way. If I uh, needed to fill a gap, I can function that way. It's so quick to rebuild polygons, though. Okay. I would rather... There's... And it's because of the bias of our workflow. We have a very specific workflow. At the point that you're likely to bump a polygon is uh, uh, after you've built polygons, right? Yeah. So in our workflow, you're almost ready to start turning things into us if you were to do it, right? Yeah. And if you were to happen to be working on one and you bump one and you're doing a whole bunch of other things, what's the likelihood that you bumped another? 
yeah, probably be... pretty decent if you're editing because you're doing retroactive edits after you've built polygons. It's probably better to fix the line work and rebuild polygons in our workflow. That's our workflow. But yes, absolutely. Those things can do things. And this comments on gaps. If you've got a gap, that means on the other side, you've got an overlap, rebuild polygons. Getting those things to align is problematic. Well, that's what a line edge is for. But again, we need to be very cautious about that in your circumstance, in our workflow, and probably better in those circumstances to just go ahead and go, oops, I goofed up polygons. Delete, take the three, five seconds. I mean, really building polygons, it just isn't that long of a process uh, to where these tools I'm not going to say that. For our workflow, I would just recommend you rebuild polygons. I'm not saying don't use these tools. Um, but because of the way we work through things, I'm I'm just going to remake polygons. I don't want to risk modifying the data in an inappropriate way. Um, that being said, I, I if I... Because I don't, I let me rephrase that. I have never used these, but if I understand what they do, that your assessment of what they do is correct. Because if it says a line edge, you take a feature, and we're looking topologically. We're going to align a topological edge where we have a rule that says must be covered by contacts and faults to its nearest face by clicking. So it will then align that topologically. My fear is that I don't know if that will close the gap or if it will move the whole polygon or it will move the unaligned segment or I would have to test this. And that's why I said I'm not prepped to example on that because I would have to really play with it in a lot of detail and come up with a lot of examples. And when I have that problem, I don't mess around. I build polygons again. It's so easy. It's almost mindless. And then when you talk about the fact that you have history, and you have built polygons previously, it's so easy to click on that history tab and be like, ah, yeah, build polygons again, double click on it. It pulls up the dialog box for building polygons. You've got your iterative, you know, um, map unit poly temp 01. You change temp 01 to temp 02, you hit enter. I mean, we're talking literal seconds to do. Okay. I guess I missed the session about history tab. How do you get that on? Where's history tab at? What you're uh, so uh, do you have used the field the the tab results, right? Uh, In Arc Map, you have uh -huh. used result. Uh, probably I don't remember. Okay, mm -hmm. I've talked about it a lot in class, and I talk about it a lot because. The results is your history. Those are the same exact functioning. So you'd go geoprocessing results. These oh, are okay. yeah, geoprocessing results. Yes, I know that. Okay. That's the history. Okay. Same thing, different word. Thanks, Esri. We greatly appreciate you naming something and then deciding to change the name retroactively. Okay. How do you get the pain for it to come up? So on the, uh, if you are in analysis, that's where your geoprocessing tools are, right? Yeah. So if we keep in mind that geoprocessing is an analysis function, our history is just to the left of the toolbox. Okay. So that would pull up your history pane, your results tab. Okay. Amy. I just wanted to mention that when you were demonstrating the move oh. tool. Did I mess up? <laughs> no. When you were demonstrating the move tool and it was keeping those topological relationships, um, go back to your edit ribbon and take your topology in the upper left there and make it say no topology in that drop down. And then it won't keep those relationships. So. Uh, sorry, where one. is that? Where is that? Help uh, me. Above your error inspector, where it says geologic map, that drop down, and then you could say no topology, and then you can move things without keeping those relationships. If you Thank you. I knew to. there was a way. <laughs> I knew there was a way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. 
again, content aware is a big thing in Arc Pro. Get used to it thinking it's smarter than you. Well, I'm going to put it that way. This is probably a discussion for when you go over topology, but Pro now has map topology, which you have selected, which ArcMap did not have. Oh, right, so right, that's right, a whole, right, new, right, whole right, new thing. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so we've gone over time by just a little bit. Uh, I am not saying that we have to stop this session. Again, we always continue uh, for extra topics afterwards. Um, I do think we're going to try it and cover metadata next, but I've said that in multiple videos now. So, you know, we'll just keep <laughs> mirroring that as the status quo. Uh, but I do want to uh, thank everyone for participating. I love these sessions. It's such a great way to help us all communicate information, share knowledge like this discussion right here. I learned things as well. Amy corrects me when I say stupid things. All of those things are wonderful. Andy reminds me of interesting things that we have had come up in the past. Um, Luke can scoff at me because I'm a goofball, whatever the case may be. These are wonderful. This is what I have wanted to do in the Bureau for a very long time, is this exchange of information, because we all have different expertise and different experiences. So I want to thank you all for that. And again, I also want to thank the GIS Services Program if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be where I'm at now. I couldn't do it without them. So I do. I want to thank everyone, and uh, we'll continue this next week, probably with metadata. So thank you all, and we will see you next week.